All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Wiley. I am a coach with Championship Chess, and I am here with special guest today, Mr. Steve Schneider. Uh, we are going to be doing a special game for you guys. Um, it is a game, one of my favorite games, uh, and believe it or not, this was actually Bobby Fischer's favorite game. Uh, it is a man by the name of Paul Morphy. He was a chess player in the 1800s. He was considered the best. Uh, he traveled all around the world, uh, beat everybody there was, and he did it exceptionally well. Uh, his main thing was he was very aggressive. He attacked towards the center. He developed his pieces, and he always got his king safe. And I think those are three main principles you should always think about when you are first playing chess. Okay, if you ever wonder, you know, what to do when you're first starting out, always think of those three things. If you're not doing one of those three things, you're probably not doing something correct. Okay, so it's a very good thing uh, to go by when you're playing. Uh, the particular game that we have here is Morphy versus the Duke of Brunswick and Count Asward. Now, this was in Paris, so I'm not sure I'm saying that exactly correct with my American accent, but... Um, Close enough, yes. So, and it was played in 1858, and it was actually played in an opera house. Uh, if you can't imagine what an opera house is, just imagine a football stadium with a stage and some people singing and playing music where they're probably playing football. So they were up in the top uh, playing chess on a little tiny board, and we were fortunate enough that somebody was there taking notes on the game and writing it down, chess notation. Uh, chess notation is very important to do. Um, so anyways, let's get started. Uh, Paul Morphy is white, okay, and he starts out with his favorite move, which was pawn to e4, okay? Very aggressive move. If you can see, it will allow the bishop to come out, the dark square bishop on f, the light square bishop, I'm sorry, on f, and the queen can also come out very aggressively, okay? And it's also known as the power of 10, all right? So... Black responds with e5, which I think, to me, is a perfectly reasonable response, okay? If this is so, e4 is so good for white, why can't this be so good for black, e5? No, I just didn't know if they could see it. Okay, so, okay, so Paul Morphy continues with knight f3, and what knight f3 does follows one of his principal rules, develops a piece, very important in chess, and it attacks the center e-pawn. Okay? So black must defend this pawn. So he does that by playing d6. Now, this gives this the name. It's called a Philidor defense. That's what this d6 pawn means. If he were to move the knight out, then we can get into a different kind of opening. Um, if he plays the f-pawn, that's not very good because uh, it exposes the king, and actually there's actually a sacrifice you can do. So d6 is not bad, but now we've got what's called the Philidor. The way Paul Morphy tries to take advantage of this is he follows another principle. He strikes out towards the center aggressively with d4. Black responds by pinning the knight on f3, and if you don't know what a pin is, which is going to be very important in this game. Uh, you'll see Paul Morphy does this quite exceptional uh, several times in how he ends up winning this game. But it's when you attack a piece that it either cannot move because it's illegal if you're pinning against a king, or if you are pinning something against a queen or something of greater value than what you're attacking, and if that what you're attacking moves, like say the knight moves, well, the bishop would just take the queen on d1. And we all know that that would not be good for white. So the knight is pinned down by the bishop. Okay, so Paul Morphy takes the pawn on E. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why the pawn cannot take, why it wouldn't be good, why it can't just take the pawn. Well, let's look at it real quick. So pawn takes pawn, and this is just going to be an example. We'll go back to the main line in a minute. So pawn takes pawn. What would happen here is if you can see now, the queen goes all the way up, captures the queen. The king has to capture it. It's check. 
And then we get the pawn here. Okay, and now not only are we up a whole pawn, but we're also threatening the fork on the f7 pawn and attacking the bishop that's on g4. So not very good for black. Already having to defend the f pawn, and then we get an extra developing move. And like I said, we're already up a pawn, and the king cannot castle. So this cannot be good for black. So that's why black didn't take the pawn. Instead, what he does is he takes the knight. Okay, so now queen takes. And by the way, a lot of you that are might just be beginners and seeing a game like this for the first time, uh, you had two options to take there. You could have taken with the queen or the g-pawn. But taking with the g-pawn is not good because three reasons. Uh, one, it doubles your pawns up, which is not that great in chess. It'll ruin your protective wall over on the king side once you castle. Right? It'll look all funny once you put your king over there. It, it won't be protected as well. And the queen stays right where it is instead of being developed. By taking with the queen, now you don't have what's called double pawns. Your queen is developed, and your king will still be safe once he castles. Okay? So now the duke and the count, they take it. So I'm going to ask my student here if he can figure out white's next move that comes with what's called a tempo, which means time. It has a threatening potential to it. What do you think, Mr. Steve? Well, I like to get my bishop out because I want to develop a piece, attack the center, threaten checkmate. So I like my bishop coming to c4. Excellent. Excellent move. And if we look at it here, we can see that, yes, in one move, White is threatening to take the pawn on f7 with the queen, and that is checkmate. The game is finished. So black must respond to that threat. He can't just do anything he wants. That's what a tempo means. You must, you know, hold this move accountable, the bishop c4. And by the way, that's why bishop c4 is the strongest move on the board. It would be much better than, say, bishop d3 or bishop e2 or even bishop b5, even though that is a check, because it can be blocked. This right here is the strongest move. So black has to respond accordingly, so he blocks with the knight. And we can see that if the queen comes up and captures the knight, that would not be good. Uh, you would lose the queen. Okay, so Paul Morphy makes a strange little move here, but I like it. Okay, he moves his queen over to b3, and if you can see what this does, first of all, it creates what's called a battery. I know that's a strange name in chess, just like fork, <laughs> but uh, it exists. And what that means is when you have two pieces working together, attacking on a square, which we can see now, the bishop now has helped to attack f7 with the queen. And if you'll notice, the queen is coming up to attack the pawn on b7. So it's a pretty good move. Comes with some major threats. Okay, so black decides to defend the f7 pawn. Now, I do want to talk about this move. And this actually seems kind of tricky at first, but let's look at it and see if you can figure it out. If the queen takes b7 right now, how can black save the rook on a8? How is that possible? What do you think, Steve? Well, there are not very many ways to protect the rook. Um, but one way to protect the rook would be to get the queen involved. But how can you get the queen involved? Um, ideally, um, if you had the opportunity you would like to put the queen um, at c6, but I don't see how you can get the queen to c6. Correct. So um, what do we do to protect the rook? We uh, need a tempo move. We have to threaten something very good. So um, 
What about checking the king? Okay. I think that looks pretty good. If we check the king, that would also attack the queen, keeping the queen from uh, taking the rook. Yes. So, and the queen is safe there because it is protected by the bishop. Yes, that's what everybody needs to see. Very good. So, yes, the queen gives check. Okay, and the bishop is right on that same diagonal, right behind it. And the queen is forced to take this. If not, if you just block this check, like say you just block the check with the bishop, then queen will take queen. Yes. But what, and that would not be good. What if the queen were to go to c8, checking the king? Well, I don't think that would be possible let's see hold on let's see so we go back to because the king was in check yes because it's a tempo move yes. it's time tempo is very important yes it was in check uh at b4 to the king on e1 so there was no time for the white queen to give check to the king right okay so let's go back and we'll go back to this move right here Okay, Paul Morphy sees this, all right? So all he wants to do is develop a piece to where if the queen came down to that B4 square, it would not be check, okay, where he would be able to take. And all he does is he develops his knight out to C3. Okay, so now the threat is to take that B7 pawn because there is no queen check. Okay, so the rook would fall. It's much different. Let's take a look really fast. Ah. Ah, okay. So, just so for example, uh, let's just pretend that happens. Okay, now watch this. Here. And look at the difference. Can you guys see the difference? There is no tempo on the king check. So, this rook is now free. And most likely, the knight soon to follow, since it's also pinned against the king. Okay? Big difference. All right. So, Paul Morphy played knight to c3. Black now must defend that pawn on b7. And he does that by c6. Okay. So, Steve, white now plays another developing move. And he wants to set a pin. How can you set a pin? Well, we always want to look at developing pieces. Uh, our bishop at c1 is not in the game yet. Yes. Uh, we don't have to hurry and castle because white's doing all the attacking. So let's get our bishop from c1 in the game. And let's see where a good place would be to put it. Well, uh, running it down, attacking the knight... So going down to g5 looks like a great place to put the bishop. Yes, indeed. Pens are extremely important in chess. That also now lets the king castle either side. Yes, which if you've never actually seen that, you're going to be witnessing that this game. Okay, yes, as you've noticed now, you now have the option to castle queen side which you just move the king over two spaces and the rook jumps a little bit further, it actually lands on D, or he can still have the option to castle on the king side. But if you'll notice something, white now has almost all his pieces developed except his rooks. Black is way behind in development. The knight is still back there on B8, the bishop is trapped back there on F8, and the only piece that's really active for black is the knight on F6, but it's pinned. It can't move. So this is how you develop your pieces. Okay? All right. So to me, this next move is a big no-no. Okay? If you're going to learn what to do as far as how to make good moves by following Morphe, you also must learn by the bad moves. You know? And uh, this game, the Duke and the Count, they make a bad move. And all you have to do during this next move is ask yourself the three questions. They play pawn to b5. And you have to ask yourself, does this develop a piece? Well, clearly it doesn't. Does this control the center of the board? 
Well, clearly it doesn't do that either. Or does this have king safety in mind? And clearly it doesn't either. It actually has the opposite effect. <laughs> he doesn't quite see it yet, but Paul Morphy was quite clever. And now he does what is called a sacrifice. Okay, And he is able to do this because his development is so good. Okay, So if you've never seen a sacrifice, what that means is when you take something of greater value, say for in this case it's the knight, three points, and he decides to take the pawn on b5, which is worth one point. This is called a sacrifice. Now you have to have a good reason. You cannot just do this just because. It looks okay. There has to be some good reason for it. And the reason for Paul Morphy in this game is because now he's going to get a massive attack because of his pieces being so well developed. So the Duke and the Count were kind of shocked right here. They didn't understand what was going on, so they took this, and now the bishop takes. And what's going on here is, obviously you can see now, this is a check. So, Steve, can you tell me why the knight on f6 cannot come and block this check? You'd lose your queen. Yes. The knight was pinned to the queen. That's the correct. The knight can move, but you certainly don't want to give your queen away. <laughs> yes. If you lose the queen like that, it's probably not going to end up very well for you. Most likely you will lose this game. So that knight, this is why this pin is so important. Okay? So he can block. He doesn't want to block with the queen, of course, uh, because the bishop will just take the queen. So he's going to block with the knight on B. Okay? Now, the next thing we're going to learn about this game is anytime you have a piece that is pinned, what you want to do is pile on that piece. Okay? And in this instance, he is going to concentrate on that knight that's on D7. Now, an important thing to remember is, is when you are piling on a piece, Okay, you have to think about the math a little bit. Okay, say for example, if we were going to try, let's say we move our queen to a4. All right, now, yes, is that piling on the piece? Sure it is, but it doesn't have the right effect because if we, let's say we attack the bishop right there, make him move. Well, now if we take this on d7, the queen can capture. And if we just trade queens like this, well, if you'll notice, white is actually down a whole piece. Remember, he did that sacrifice. So now black eventually would get ahead in this game and probably win this game. So queen a4 is not strong enough. So what we want to do is make sure if the queen takes back, it would not be good. So how does Paul Morphy handle this? Well, what do you think, Steve? If you castle on the queen side, your rook is going to be on the D file, and you'll have the rook attacking the knight. The neat thing about castling on the king side is the king is, is pretty safe. Uh, you castle on the queen side, the king's a little open, but in, in exchange you've got your rook, in this case on an open file, coming right down on that pin piece. Yes, indeed, and that is exactly what he does. He castles... Queenside. Okay, and now look at the difference. Let's say now we have that same A6 move, okay? So now taking that, obviously now, if the queen takes, we can see that the rook would just come right down here and gobble up that queen. Okay? So, and that wouldn't be good. All right. So, so this is a big threat now to take this. And we also still realize the knight on f6 is pinned. It would not be able to take that without losing the queen to the bishop on g5. So what does black do here? Well, he comes and he protects it with the rook. Okay? So now this is where, to me, even though, as we can see, Black has all what's called space. It means freedom for his pieces. 
This bishop on g5 is creating a pin. The bishop on b5 is creating a pin against the d7 knight. Uh, the queen on b3 is very active and go in many different places. Uh, the rook on d1, complete open file. Okay, so anytime you get space and freedom for your pieces like this, good things will happen. When you are cramped up, like you can clearly see black is, <laughs> the king almost looks smothered, okay, in here. It can't even breathe. You know, it's uh, attacked by almost all his own pieces. That is not good, okay? Um, so anytime you see that you're the one that has all this space against the cramped thing, look for things called tactics. We already did one sacrifice, but here now comes a tactic, okay? And what he does is he does what's called an exchange sacrifice, all right? He takes that knight on d7. Now, Steve, can you tell me again why the knight can't take that? Lose your queen. Lose the queen. Remember the pin. Remember the bishop on g5. So you can't do that. So the knight can't take. The queen can't take because the bishop on b5 will just take it. So the rook is forced to take it. So keeping with the same theme that if you have a piece that is pinned, you keep piling on the piece. Steve, what do you think white does here? Well, it'd be really nice to get your other rook, uh, white's other rook in the game, so the rook could come over from the H file to the D file, and it's safe there because black's rook is pinned, absolute pinned. The rook is pinned to the king, so now we've piled on that rook a second time. Very good, and that's exactly what he does. The only piece that hasn't even been involved in the game, now it's involved. And again, let's look at the threat. Let's just say, again, let's just make this silly willy move right here, okay? A6, well, watch this. Now we have check. You now know the knight on F6, if it takes, loses the queen, yes. So again, and if the queen takes, we just take with the rook. So we're threatening to win that piece again. So. This gives black a little bit of dilemma. So what does he do? Well, he actually plays what seems at first a pretty clever move. Okay? So what this does, it threatens to trade queens, which, by the way, even though Morphe is not doing this, if you are in trouble, okay, if you are cramped up, if you every now and then we all find that that happens. You know, sometimes it can't be avoided, or you make mistakes, which makes your game cramped. Okay, the main thing you want to try to do is trade off pieces. Okay, that will give you some freedom to breathe. All right, and just switch that. If you have an attack and you're not cramped and you're facing somebody that's cramped, you really don't want to trade pieces because all that does is help them. So this queen e6 move does two things. It relieves some of the pressure by trying to trade queens. And it relieves the pressure of the pin of the knight on f6. Okay? Very important. When I first saw this game, I thought, oh, wow, I think Paul Morphy misplayed his hand here. I don't, I don't think he has anything. But this is why this game became so famous. Okay? By the following sequence of moves. All right. And we'll see if you guys can actually spot the checkmate. I'll even ask... Uh, Steve over here, if he can see it too, and you guys will have a couple seconds to see if you can see it. So first thing he does is he takes the rook. All right, now obviously the queen can't take, but now the knight can take. Okay, and it's checked by the way, so the knight should take it. And now, believe it or not, there is a checkmate in two moves. Okay, and the little hint I can try to give you is the tactic is called removing the guard. If you can actually see that that knight on d7, if that wasn't there, rook could come all the way down to d8 with the help of the bishop on g5, and that is checkmate. So my question to you guys and to Steve here is how can we force that knight to move? It doesn't matter how we do it. Keep that in mind. If the knight moves, the rook can go down to d8, and we have checkmate. So whatever you're doing to get that rook down there to d8, it's fine, 
Okay, so take a couple seconds and let's see if we can figure out this tactic. Sacrifice, by the way, is what this is. And the tactic is called removing the guard. The knight is guarding the place we want. We want to remove that knight. Okay? Steve, as soon as you figure it out, let's see if you can tell us the answer. Okay, I'm good. Uh, of course, if the knight wasn't there, the queen could come down and, and also do checkmate. Ah, that's true. So the knight is really a pain. And, you know, since the queen can come down and threaten checkmate, uh, queen to the eighth rank, checking the king. That's going to force the knight to do something. Yes. The king is in a position where it will then have, and it says now, it has no moves. Yes. So just king has no moves, it's telling you, go get him. So Correct. Queen. And keep this in mind, before I make the actual move, uh, this move right here, for say, you know, a lot of the students that I show this game to, they always make moves like this. Or like this, okay? But this is not correct because this does not force the knight to move. Yes, you are attacking the knight, but that is a difference between forcing the knight to move. So as Steve pointed out, the correct move is queen to b8. Check. And this seems crazy, right? Giving away the queen for no reason. Oh, but... As we've just mentioned, now the rook can come all the way down for a beautiful little two-piece checkmate. Okay, so um, I know it seems odd that you would be able to do this type of thing. Okay, but there are reasons that this happened. Okay, a couple of the reasons are, A, Paul Morphy developed all his pieces. Okay, and he developed them to the most aggressive squares possible. B, he got his king nice and safe, tucked away. He didn't have to worry about any kind of attack. Uh, and the third thing is, he was very aggressive towards the center. And if you can recall, uh, earlier in the game, when Black, when Black played this move right here, Okay, if you remember asking yourselves, did that develop a piece? No. Did that control the center? No. Did that have his king castled? No. He clearly should have just kept developing and tried to work on all those other things. So this was why Paul Morphy was able to do the sacrifice and all these things started happening. Okay, and the next important thing was he took advantage of the pin and he piled on the pin. Remember... This move started it all, okay? He's got a pin. Well, what do you do when you have a pin? You pile on the pin. So he does this castling, threatening the pin, okay? Um, anytime you have a piece that's pinned, if you can pile on it, pile on it. And if you have options of piling on it, like remember when we did the queen out to A4, well, that wasn't the best option just because the queen can take back. You know, sometimes you do have to do the math. Okay, so um, all these things came about to create this little beautiful checkmate. Okay, and this game has stood the test of time. Like I said, Bobby Fischer loved this game. Uh, this was one of my favorite games to play. Um, so anytime you're playing a chess game or you are looking at a chess game, try to look for these things. Okay, they happen all the time. All right, pins are probably the most common tactic. So anytime you see a pin, try to create a pin. Anytime you can develop your pieces, develop them aggressively. Get your king safe and try to attack towards the center. I think you guys might, you know, even if you're not going to be like this, like Paul Morphy, you can have some great games and you can get many checkmates yourself. Okay, uh, well, this was Chris Wiley. Uh, this has been fun. And uh, I hope we can do another one of these sometime. And I'd like to thank my student, Steve, for helping me out. Uh, he was great. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.